going to come back to the Day 9 Daily where we learn to be a better gamer. We're looking at EG's Idra versus TSL Revival. In Part 1, I basically told a story about skydiving. In Part 2, what we did is try to look really closely and very zoomed in at all the decisions of drones versus units for Idra to see exactly how we got so far ahead. Um, in that drone count going into the mid-game. And because this is a 28-minute game, and we're only at the 12-minute mark, we're going to go through the later parts of the game a little bit faster because I want to try to focus more on the broad, overarching goals in Zerg Reserve rather than little tiny specifics. I focused a lot on the specifics in Part 2 because I think it's so critical that in the situation where we're basically both doing the same thing, that you can still find some edge to work with. Both players are basically going roaches. I mean, yeah, Idra has four Hydras out, but it's basically roaches, three bases, roaches, three bases. Same thing across the board. Everything looking all the same. But suddenly we see Idra has way more drones. Cool. And we also see Revival going for a lot of roaches. Now, there is a macro hatch going down by Idra. I'm, I'm going to basically not pay that much attention to this right now. This is actually going to be critical, but I want to just zoom ahead for a brief period of time. Keep this macro hatch in mind. Keep this macro hatch in mind, because it kind of relates back to goals. Idris still going to be very far ahead. He's going to be gathering himself a good bit of roaches and hydras. Uh, continuing to build away. Did not really get that many more drones, but hey, what do you know? Revival is starting to get his upgrades up. Um, we see he's at 1-0, Idra is at 2-0, just now starting his armor upgrade. And want to see something really annoying? Alright, let me show you something really annoying. If I hit Alt-F, they just swap colors. Ha, ah, how's that look? Idra's blue, Revival's red. Oh, look, let's swap it back. Look, you know what? I like Idra is red, and Revival is blue. No, you know what? Let's have Idra is blue. I actually had it this way when I started, and my brain almost fucking exploded. Look at this. Idra, blue, getting plus two missile attack. Wait, he already has it. How's that possible? Oh, I must have had Alt-F on. All right, cool. Cool. Now, we see Idra moving out through the middle with a huge force, and it might seem like you're just saying, oh yeah, get matched with Roach Hydra and go, go, go. This game is so stupid. I hate this matchup. But now let's talk instead about goals that you have in this matchup. Well, hey, we want this gold expansion as Idra. So what we're going to do is we're going to get maxed, and as our fourth base, we're going to be going for this. Attack while you expand, but specifically try to expand here, and when you attack, look at this, attacking through the gold area. You see that drone that tried to go up there? Nada. I don't think so. Why are we able to do this with such ease? Because boom, we have our plus two attack upgrade. Let me actually come back to the start of the game uh, and note that, okay, at the 8-minute mark, well, gee, we actually started our upgrade pretty early. At the 10-minute mark, our upgrade was just now finishing up, and we just now finished our layer. Shortly thereafter, we actually started our upgrade. It finishes in about 3 minutes, and what do you know? About 3 minutes later, excuse me, about 3 minutes later, a little bit later, that's when we end up moving out to push. What does Revival have? Well, Revival has not those upgrades, right? This whole push uh, the, to be able to deny the gold and secure the gold all began with this early plus one upgrade. And we can now have that clear goal because we had that nice setup for it. Now, this macro hatch that Idra is going to be exploiting, he's a little bit ahead in terms of this drone count. Well, great. Well, what the hell am I going to do with a really, really, really good economy? Well, I know what I'm going to do is just try to absolutely blast where he's going to be taking his third base, or excuse me, his gold base. I'm going to take my gold base. I'm going to keep pressuring. Look, is Idra, is Idra actually trying to attack here or here? I mean, it doesn't look like it. Maybe he's trying to get into a good position, and maybe if he kills these off, he'll, he'll be content. But it looks like he's mainly trying to engage the army at a decent enough angle so his Hydras can step into the fray. Pretty bad attack angle, to be honest. Pretty, pretty hideously bad attack angle. But you know what? He's getting up this expansion. And look at Revival. Also taking his fourth, but suddenly forced into a different location. And thank you to our macro hatch, we now have 23 roaches building, while our opponent only has 15. Idris is holding down that R button. 
holding it down. He's going to pull back up to this gold expansion area. Has a lot of roaches here rallied, getting this little upgrade. But no matter what happens in this attack, I don't think that Idric can possibly lose all his units. Which means that his gold ends up getting established. That's fantastic news. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking to yourself, Herp Derp, what about Broodlords? What about Ultralisks and Infestors and all that good jazz? I'm going to come back to that as we get a little bit later into the 4 base for 4 base logic. Until then, notice that it's mainly trading. It's mainly trading. Idra does end up getting bested here. Again, I think there's some probably slightly suboptimal attack angles. And then, hilariously, we have... Just Roach versus Just Roach. And in the production tab, we see Just Roach and Idra getting a pair of drones. Just Revival thinking about doing a little bit of burrow action, but, you know, it's going to be a pretty typical defense over here. But note that Idra has a gold base, and that Revival has himself a blue base. I don't know what else to call these other than blue. And great, we had a really simple goal that we wanted to go for to establish solid control over our gold expansion and to get that up, and my god, it looks like we've actually done it. And this is going to come into huge effect later on. I mean, it's kind of obvious, I think, to everyone that gold is obviously better than a blue base. Whoops. And his Idra is going to barely be able to save himself. And again, I think that perhaps a slightly different angle to change things. But hey, he's still making a couple of Hydras, generally only making them when he's like 150 food or greater. And you can try to watch his play and discover little rules like that for yourself if you want. Some pretty dry looking trading, but let's not worry about the fact that our sci-fi explosion uh, instincts want more action strategically. There's some very, very interesting things going on. So I'm going to speed up, and I want to do some counting really fast. All right, we have basically 70 drones versus 70 drones. What resource does your late game tech rely on? Gas. Easy. No problem at all. But let's do some counting, shall we? Okay, if we need gas, what happens if we have one, two, let's see, three, four, we should do that, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Geysers. If we have all eight geysers there, that's three times eight. That's 24 drones. Wow. If we have 70 workers and 24 of them are mining, that's a third of our workforce getting gas. A third of our workforce. On, on just three bases, on three bases, you'll have a slightly less than that. You'll have about a quarter of the mining gases. But the more bases you take necessarily the less mineral income you will have again assuming that you're you're staying at about the same amount of drones so what this means is that roach hydra timing attacks are going to be way stronger than they were before uh the more expansions that you end up taking idra's doing like a really simple burrow harass here but we're going to see this gas issue come up for tsl revival whereas Idra's doesn't end up coming up because he has this gold expansion up. More trades going on. As far as I'm concerned, I really think that Idra's goal here, um, whether it is a you know a conscious, uh, explicitly stated goal, is that he wants to try to engage in a lot of trades while he has an even economy. And that way, even though they're both going to be doing the identical thing, simply because he has the gold, he'll be able to step ahead. Sure, there's this harassment stuff going on, but the one thing that's consistent to note about Idra is that he will never overcommit to this sort of harassment. He'll never have like 20 roaches coming down here and 20 roaches dying. He will do no roaches separated from his main force or maybe a handful. Maybe, maybe a handful. But never too many. Very few. Not a lot of harassment. Now controlling those, now getting up his infestation pit, which is somewhere around here, because, my god, I see the pathogen glands going up. So Idra is going to bolster this force with his friendly pathogen glands. He still has a big Roach Hydra army. It looks like Revival's taking his fifth, Idra taking his fifth. Identical play, for the most part, 
both getting a layer. Or excuse me, we have a hive, both getting hive. All right, good. Both getting fifth bases, both getting their thirds at around the same time. But Idra, just by getting this early plus upgrade, controlling the gold, securing his own gold, has this nice little lead. We hear tons of changelings dying at a ridiculous pace. Yes, they're still dying. I don't believe it. But now that we have all these geysers operational, I'm going to come to this income tab and note that it's looking like our mineral and gas count is pretty damn even. From, um, that actually doesn't make sense to me. I guess it's later when that ends up happening. Ah. Ah. Oh, there's the drones. All right, cool. <laughs> Moving right along. And Idra is going to do his usual hive tech, right? He's going to be getting a, a greater spire. We're going to see uh, TSL Revival go for Ultralisks, but that never actually comes up into play. The Ultralisk Broodlord, none of that funky monkey business comes into play. And that's what excited me so much about this game. It's literally a straight up, period, straight up Roach Hydra Infester game versus Roach Hydra Infester game. As, as equivalent as you can see. Um, without any player being like, well, he was losing, but he got Broodlords faster. TSO Revival now is in the lead in upgrades, or actually about two minutes ago. Actually, I'll pull back to then. At the 20-minute mark, Idra actually was still at 2-1 upgrades, whereas our other Zergi buddy uh, caught up. However... It's not that Idra wanted to have that upgrade edge all game long. His upgrade edge was just enough so that he could do this push here to secure himself up the gold expansion. Let's speed back to where we were before. And of course, you should experience some lag because we're times aiding this game. All right, there we go. Now, Idra does have the fortunate use of a couple of these um, infestors to deal some damage. They're not the beastly tide turners that they were before. Way better arc on the south side. Uh, a decent arc up at the top side for Revival. Idra ends up getting shoved back, but if we come back to this Income tab, you're going to see that Idra, with just a few more workers, is way ahead in Minerals. And a lot of this is because all these Gas Geysers from Revival are full of gas. All these in the mains is 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 24... Um, Wait a minute. I said 8 times 4 earlier was 24. Holy cat. Oh my god. I can't believe I did that. It's 32. Woo! Oh my god. I can't believe. Wait. No. 8 times 3 is 24. I did get it right. How am I getting my math wrong? Wait. What the hell? I'm messing something up. Hold on. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. There we go. Woo! 21, 24. I'm not, I'm not crazy. Still 24. About half. I, sh I should trust my notes before the show. They're on a notepad to the side. I should just like not second guess what I calculated beforehand. Yeah, 24 of our 54 drones, half of our workers are mining gas. We're seeing that come forward. So despite the fact that Idra is actually basically having the equivalent army size here, both of them are going to have infestors up soon. Both of them are producing a lot of roaches. We're going to see that Idra just has this superior economy. And it's going to be a pretty clear, simple, easy win. Remember this macro hatch that I talked so much about? This macro hatch contributes to this idea of us getting up this gold earlier on. It's not, hey, let's just secure gold. Let's just get a lot of drones early on. It's let's get a lot of drones and do something with it. Let's get this fourth hatch up. And what we're going to do is shove back on his gold. Everything is about shoving back on the gold. I want you to look up at the production tab during this whole thing. Yeah, they're both getting upgraded at about the same time, but look at Idra producing his roaches. This is the, a very bad angle for Idra for most of this fight. It has been quite, quite not so good. Now, it does look like the Hydrolis did manage to help enough. They're both going to do their little burrow funness. And notice the TSL Revival, oh no, at 170. Idra at 200, 200. Still having about the same amount of drones, 52 to 57. And the clean sprint in. And look, we see Corruptors getting produced from Idris. We see, we see two Ultros from Revival, but Idris is just maxed. The Broodlords and Ultros never actually step into the field, and it's just simply this gold expansion really kicking in. I generally hate this income tab. I never really feel like it reveals as much. But the fact that Idris' income was so much higher at key points in time gave him all the extra money, and only now... 
are both players broke except Idra is at 200 food and his opponent's at 90. Kind of cool, kind of cool. I mean, we see a lot of Terran players doing something similar to this where they'll say something like, um, uh, they'll get their gold expansion up very, very quickly, trying to mine it out, intending to move it away later on in the game. You see this in Metalopolis a lot. Uh, Idra basically saying, well, in this Zerg vs. Zerg, I'm going to try to drone up as much as I possibly can. I'm going to try to get ahead in upgrades, and I'm going to get this fourth macro hatch up. And I am going to use this big army to make a huge shove right when I get the plus two attack upgrade. I should be ahead of you in upgrades. I'm almost certainly going to be ahead of you in this shoving competition, in the in the tug of war. Um, but um, and then I can use that to get up my fourth base, and you're going to have a hard time getting up your fourth base. Idra just outproduced his opponent, but it wasn't as simple as oh he has more guys, he'll just outproduce. It's he's getting more drones at all at various key points in time, largely that we looked at in part two. And then he's using it in a smart, simple, consistent way. A lot of people tend to just be like, well, if I'm going to, if I have a better economy, I can do whatever I want and then I'll win. There are builds that are economy focused where you really desperately need to keep all your forces tightly packed. And then some low econ builds where you actually necessarily must keep your army split up and be harassing all over the place. Good stuff. Simple goals. Let's go ahead and take some questions. Markio's question grabber. Markio's question grabber. Question. Start. Let's see here. Yeah. Here we go. So Fear Dragon 64 is saying the following. Dear Day 9, earlier you briefly mentioned that you can assume your opponent didn't do something like 10 pool because the timing should have already hit. I've had issues with this mentality when my opponents just delay their push. Um, now this is true, um, but I want to I want to make absolutely certain that you're very, very careful with this. Let me name three abstract attacks. So that way we don't even care what matchup there is. There is the, a rush, there's a, an early attack, and then there is a mid-game attack. All right, so let's say these are three things you're worried about. You're worried about him rushing you, you're worried about him doing an early attack, you're worried about him doing a mid-game attack. And these might come at something like four minutes, six minutes, and eight minutes. Um, If, for some reason, delaying the attack makes it better, then you can count that as another legitimate thing. You can have, for instance, a rush, an early attack at six minutes, the same early attack, but at seven minutes, and then a mid-game attack. That's okay to sort of like shove another little finger in there. It's okay to account for that sort of strategy <laughs> in between. <laughs> what have I said? But what I don't want you to say, what I don't want you to do is just say, because he delays it, it must be better. A lot of times there's a rush, an early attack, and a mid-game attack, and only an attack that comes at those three times is actually good at all. A lot of times, if you, for instance, do a six pool, but wait till you have 12 Zerglings and then attack, it is a shit six pool, and it will do nothing. It will be horrifically, terribly bad. If you position your Overlord timings correctly, 10 pools will hit you with six Lings at certain times, and if he's trying to delay and wait, you can get the appropriate amount of stuff up, and he just has a shitty 10 pool. That's the really important thing to note. So, happens in Protoss Protoss. There's a four gate and a delayed four gate. The delayed four gate is actually quite good. There's uh, like a one one one, and then a really delayed one one one. And the delayed one 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 is actually not very good because your opponent is going to see it and have a good sense of what's coming. And the fact that it is delayed and maybe could surprise you a little bit is not good at all. Not good at all. Ah. Uh. Take this question from Kudo. Dear Day9, how do you scout if a player is rushing Mutalisks reliably? Now, um, this is where you have to do your 
set of logic. You have to like do, if he's doing A or B or C, okay, and then step forward. Is he doing D or E or F, and then step forward. In this game, um, Idra was, was hitting a moment where he's going, okay, is he going to attack me, or is he powering a little bit? At that juncture, let's do a little bit of scouting. Okay, cool. Is he going to attack me, or is he going to be going for more powering and more delaying? And Idra's always leaning towards the powering side, the always more droning, upgrading, layering side. And Idra got his layer up pretty damn fast. So, given everything that happened, if Idra is getting his layer up pretty damn fast, then it is impossible for his opponent to beat Idra to Mutalisks. In other words, Idra will get that Overseer in there and scout the Mutalisks coming before the Mutalisks are done, period. That must happen because Idra's leaning to this side. If Idra leaned the other way and went crazy mad aggression or something like that, then Idra would not have his layer up early, and he would have to do something like uh, do some attacks at the front. Again, in early Zerg vs Zerg, you kind of build a couple more units up. Um, then you think you need for defense, and if he's not attacking, you can just go attack him back. Things like that. Um, so, I mean, using an Overseer as the mechanism is obviously fine, but the important thing is that Idra's always trying to get his own layer up quickly. And that's sort of like a clear goal that comes across in his play. And if for some reason the opponent is just not going Mutalist and is doing something else, like a huge early attack, then you can do the emergency crazy response, and then you still know that no Mutalists are coming up. Notice how different those three things are. If I'm aggressive, I attack him and kill him, and if he's trying to go Mutalist, then I kill him more easily. The second one is we're both going layer pretty damn fast, and I'm just going to directly look at and see the Overseer, or I'm going layer pretty fast and you're trying to attack me early, so I just need to focus on crazy defense mode, and I still know that you're not going Spire. Three completely different ways of scouting it, but that's what makes Zerg vs Zerg a little bit confusing, is that you have to have a couple different ways of identifying the same thing in different situations. So let me see here, yeah. Hmm. Um, so, oh, wh where was it? Um, yeah, from, s from Sophisticated. Dear Day9, do you feel that the Spire that Revival never used hurt his play? Why did he never use his Spire? What would have been different if the Spire had never been built? Um, so... Again, this is it relates back to this idea of surprise that people do. It can it can be very surprising that whoa, he built a spire and no mutilus came and it was just a bunch of roaches. Wow, craziness. This can catch a lot of opponents off guard. However, instead what happened for revival is that he built the spire and just had a weaker roach push. He didn't have the upgrades. 200 200 on a spire. Well, an Evolution Chamber and a 1-1 upgrade, well, that's 175, 100. That's cheaper than the Spire. If you didn't build the Spire, you can get an upgrade. Hell, if you didn't build two less Roaches, you could actually get the 1-1 upgrades and a no Spire and then push, right? There's a bunch of these sorts of things that you can go through. Um, I think the reason that Idra was able to deal with it so well is because he only built two Spore Crawlers, period. Just two Spore Crawlers, <laughs> Nada, that's it. Just done. Stop right there. A lot of times players will build like nine spore crawlers. Like three at base three, three at base two, and then three in the main. And be like, alright, I think I'm okay versus Mutalisks. And then the Mutalisks never come. But again, it's more about units. And Idra cleverly just building those two in the main that was hardest to get to. And it is natural in his third, where he was kind of aggressively positioned. It was all go, go, go. Uh, last question. Let's see. Hmm. Hmm. I'll take this question. So, from Dud Dud123. Dear Day 9, despite Idrid Technic for Banelings, he did not utilize it. Do you have any suggestions for, um, to help implement Banelings in all stages of the game in Zerg vs. Zerg? He actually did use Banelings um, in a sort of kind of abstract sense, right? He didn't get a huge hit with Banelings, and there were not a lot of Zerglings that were up there. But he built a Baneling Nest, which allowed him to comfortably, or a better word would be 
correctly build drones in the early game. If he had built no baneling nests at the start of the game, he'd be taking tremendous risks. He builds the baneling nest and says, ah, now I have the leisure time to build drones. If for some reason Revival was getting a bunch of Zerglings and doing a big surprise attack, Idris says, no problem, I already have a baneling nest up, I am in good shape. This is the equivalent of saying, well, that Terran guy built a bunker right at the start of that Terran versus Protoss, but the Protoss never attacked. And the answer is, well, the Terran actually the Protoss could have moved out with Stalkers and Zealots and killed him had that bunker not been made. So there was no interaction necessarily, but the purpose was very, very clear and necessary. And how do you use Banelings in all stages of the game? Zerg with Zerg? Baneling drops? I don't know. That seems to be more stylistic than anything. Baneling drops seems like the good one. Mm, yeah. I'm done. I'm going to go to State of the Game now with Mr. J.P. McDaniel. Next week's Fun Day Monday is the following. It is the Money Dump 2v2 Fun Day Monday. Play a game where after the five-minute mark, only one of you can expand and only one of you can build units. Ah, the expanding probe building one transfers all the money to the macroing one. But it's only after the five minutes when that happens. Because before the five minutes, you can't transfer funds. Ah! Bye! You're all very beautiful.